the millennium, right around the same time as the Pentium 4 was making its debut. A bit much anticipated, Dual Pentium 3 VP6 board began shipping. Today we are going to repair and recreate my main rig from back in the early 2000s. I have been collecting parts for this project for a very long time, and a few weeks ago I finally got the last piece to the puzzle. Unfortunately this VP6 is damaged, several components are missing from the board, so we need to repair it before we can install it. The VP6 is also known for bad electrolytic caps, and that's how I lost my original board back in the day. This board is untested, so let's start with a quick test. I will of course talk about all the bits and pieces and all the specs as we build this machine. But for now, let's just do simple tests. Because everything is untested. Even this CPU that we aren't actually going to be using in the build. Okay, a bare minimum of untested stuff hooked up to the board. Let's see if it will post. While the fan spins up in a graphics card and a CPU. But we're getting nothing on the screen. So let's swap that graphics card. Okay, random untested graphics card number two. Let's try again. No, still the same thing. Okay, random untested graphics card number three. Let's try again. No, we're getting nothing on the screen. So this board is probably shot. Okay, let's change tactics and try out some parts first. Before we continue to test the board, I moved all the stuff to another machine here. Let's give this a try. No, it's completely dead, so perhaps one of the parts we use to test the VP6 may actually be bad. Okay, I replaced the RAM stick. Let's try again. No, nothing. It's completely dead. Well, I've done some tests here now. And I think this IBM just died. Oh, interesting. Now the fan spins up. We've got some high voltage. And it posts. So that was a bad power supply. Well, we're not gonna go far with this tiny thing here. So I'll start looking for a new power supply, I guess. Okay, back at the VP6. And uh, now with tested parts. And an absolutely tiny power supply. Let's try again. Oh, the fan spins up. Only in the power supply and the CPU. Well, I just assumed that the CMOS battery was dead. But let's just make sure and clear CMOS. And then do a final test. Well, that's odd. Now it's completely dead. The CPU fan doesn't even spin up. This thing just got worse than it was. Well, that was rather unexpected behavior. So let's replace that coin cell and do one more final test. Okay, now the fan spins up again. But we still have nothing on the display. So that board is quite dead, all right. Let's move to the bench and see if we can fix it. Before we start soldering, let's have a quick look at the case. This is the only significant part that I actually still don't have. Unfortunately, I don't remember who manufactured the case I had, so I haven't been able to even search for it. If you know anything about this case, please share. Instead, I went with this period correct but very dusty and scratched up Chief Tech Dragon. I don't think it gets more early 2000 than this. You may recognize it from Alienware's lineup back then. The paint is pretty rough, so we are going to respray it. I'll get back to the case later, but for now I'll take it apart and wash it off camera. Oh, I just had to stop here and start the camera. This thing is disgusting. It probably hasn't been cleaned since August of 2001. Oh, it just gets worse. This is disgusting. I actually think it's quicker to remove these rivets than having to mask off the entire case. These are quite easy to remove and replace. Yeah, that lid is in a pretty bad condition. I'm not sure if the camera picks this up. But it definitely needs a respray. Okay, so this board has some damaged and missing components. 
located close to both CPU sockets. I asked you guys in a previous video for some help to identify them. And YouTuber Big Bad Biologist Big Bad Bench pulled out his VP6 board in one of his live streams, took the components of his board and checked. So before we get started, thank you. I highly recommend his live stream by the way, he does vintage computer repairs too. I uh, will leave a link below this video to his channel. As we suspected, they are all ceramic caps, very likely damaged when someone removed or installed the heat sinks. Ok, so let's start with BC59 here. As I mentioned, they are very close to the sockets. So no rework station here. I'll just add tons of fresh solder and then try to remove them by heating up both sides. Splash of flux. Uh, we may as well clean up TC7 here. That cap is missing completely. And some good old wick. Let's clean that flux off and have a look at those pads. Well, there is still some crap left from this missing cap here. That isn't too keen to come off. Let's try to add some fresh solder and then remove it with wick. Yeah, that's much better. And then some fresh solder on one of the pads. This is really tight. Okay, so BC59 is a tiny 1.5 micro ceramic cap and it's really hard to reach. I'm also trying not to damage the socket. Okay, I skipped ahead here. But it was really tricky to get that damn thing in place because it's so hard to reach. So let's just add some more solder on both sides. Next we have TC7 here. Uh, the pads are quite a bit larger. So this one should be a bit easier. Still a tiny component though. TC7 measured 4.3 microfarads, so I'm gonna go with 3.9 and add some solder to the other side. Let's clean that flux off before we move on. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay, moving on to BC24 here. It's missing completely. And it's even harder to reach. Not sure if I can replace it without melting something. Okay, those are nice and clean pads. Splash of solar, some flux. And BC24 measured 1.35 microfarad. So I'll go with 1.5. And now to the tricky bits. There isn't room enough to grab it with the tweezers. I'll just try to hold it in position with the screwdriver. Yeah, I think that worked. But now I have to try to reach this damn pad inside here. That's not going to be easy. Let's try with a blob of solder on the tip. And tons of flux. Well, I think that worked, but I can't really see, to be honest. Yeah, I think that went okay. Let's move on to what's left of these caps here. BC47. TC5 is completely gone. And BC48. Yeah, the leftovers are coming off easily. Well, BC48 is stubborn. It wants to stay on the board. Let's try with more solder. Yeah, that helped. So let's clean up those pads. Pads are fine. So let's add some fresh solder. Okay, BC47 measured 1.2 microfarads that's close enough to 1.5 more flux and a fresh cap let's try the same method here 
I'll just push on it with a screwdriver. Uh, use a blob of solder on the tip of the soldering iron. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, TC5 measured 4 microfarads. That's close enough to 3.9. These large pads are way easier. Okay, TC5 is done. And then we have the final cap, VC48, and it measured 1.3 microfarads. That's close enough to 1.5. So I'll just push on the cap with the screwdriver again and apply a blob of solder on the other side. Okay, let's clean up that mess. Okay, that's good enough for me. Well, not the best angle, but hopefully you can see here. So here's one of the replaced caps. Uh, this is the bracket for the heatsink. So no wonder someone ripped that cap off when mounting the heatsink. Okay, time for a test. Well, CPU fan spins up as it did before. But we still have nothing on the screen. And to be perfectly honest, I didn't expect it either. Okay, let's replace some electrolytic caps. I found a list of recommended caps to replace on the badcaps.net forum. Let's start with these. So these are 1500 microfarad, 6.3 volts, and there are 15 of these. Let's try the easiest method first, and just use the desoldering gun. Well, that one was easy, but let's try this pin soldered to this large ground plane. No, that didn't work, but let's try a few more. No, this isn't working, so we're gonna need to heat this board up first. Okay, I used my cheapo heat gun and heated the board up for about 30 seconds. Let's try again. No, still doesn't work. Okay, 30 more seconds. Yeah, I think that did the trick. Yeah, that cap just fell right out. I am of course skipping ahead here, but I am heating each pad for about 10 seconds before I suck that solder out. No, that still isn't quite enough. More heat. Okay, 40 more seconds with the heat gun. Yep, that worked for sure. Yep, that one fell right out. Yeah, that did the trick. Those caps are falling right out. And by heat gun, I don't mean the rework station. I mean a cheap heat gun from the hardware store for about 10 bucks. And then about 10 seconds with a desoldering gun at 450, which is quite a high temperature. I rarely go that high. But this was a stubborn board. And now the board cooled down again. More heat with the heat gun. Okay, that's a nice pile of caps. So what are these? These are Jackon branded. Well, they don't look apparently bad. But some of them are bulging slightly. Okay, still some solder left in a few of the pads. Let's clear them. With the desoldering needles. What a stubborn board. This doesn't work. Let's heat up that board again. Okay, 30 seconds of heat. Let's try again. Still doesn't work. I'll crank up the soldering iron to 450. I try to avoid temperatures this high because they can damage the pads. No, still doesn't work. What an incredibly stubborn board. I'll apply some more heat. Okay, 30 more seconds. Oh, finally. Well, that's a large ground plane, but this is silly. Oh, here we go. Okay, let's replace those caps. With low ESR Panasonics. These are much thinner than the original caps, but they are a bit taller. That could be something to consider. 
depending on what heatsink you're going to use on your board. In my case, that's going to work out just fine. These caps have some funny legs, so I used my needle nose pliers and straightened them up. Let's see if they are easier to solder than desolder. No, those solder joints don't look too good. I better preheat the board before I solder those caps. Okay, let's try again. Yeah, that's much better. Those are nice solder joints. I'm skipping ahead here, but I am heating each pad for about 10 seconds before I apply the solder because this board is sucking up so much heat. Okay, let's snip those legs off in this now rather toasty corner. Uh, clean up that flux. Okay, nice and tidy in this corner and some very happy caps. Well, I have a bunch more of these spread out on the board, but the weird thing about this board is that the rest of the caps are a different brand. And some of the caps on this board, like these two here, they have date codes from 2013. So this board seems to have been partially recapped at some points. But the caps we just removed, they were bulging slightly. So they were probably not replaced back in 2013. Well, I just noticed that this cap here has some flux residue. This cap too, and these two as well. And these two. Okay, so yeah, definitely a partially recapped board. Some of them are on my recommended list, so I'll replace them anyways. And this plastic part here has some burn marks on it. So yeah, someone has definitely been messing around with this board. I'll remove a few caps off camera now. I found a date here, by the way. This board was made in week 43 in 2000. Okay, we have a minor problem here. This cap here is a bit too large for some graphics cards. At least this card here. I can't push this card all the way down. And that cap is the same size as the one I pulled out. So let's make a bodge. I took some heat shrink tubing and bend the legs of this cap in a 90 degree angle. This way we can lay the cap flat. Well, that's pretty enough for me. Uh, now I can use whatever graphics card I please. Okay, the rest of the caps are 1000 micro. I thought I ordered two different spacings, but these legs are just bent out. So that was a bit of a wasted time. Okay, these are the four caps. That was supposed to have 5mm spacing, but luckily there is plenty of space here, so it doesn't really matter. These bent legs will work just fine. Okay, the only remaining caps now are these two caps here, and one of them is definitely bulging. And then we've got these two here, and these are the two caps that were dated in 2013, but I'll go ahead and replace them anyways. This cap here is very close to that burnt plastic piece that I showed earlier. So now we know how that happened. And here's another one. So let's shield them off before I apply the heat. Last cap here is going to give us the same problem with the graphics card. So let's make the same bodge and lay it flat. Well, that was the last happy cap. So I'll check my work. And we are ready for a test. Okay, fingers crossed. Fan spins up. It does help if I turn the display on. Yes, it posts! Awesome! The VP6 is alive. By the way, if you like this video, let me know with a thumbs up. We are of course going to max this board out. With dual Pentium 3 copper mine. These are SL4C8, 1 GHz, 256 k level 2 cache. These are the fastest CPUs this board will take. At least according to ABIT. More on this in an upcoming video. I have ordered some really cool PCBs for this board. Hit the bell icon below and set it to all if you want to join me. Let's not forget the thermal pastes. It took a while, but I finally managed to source two of these Thermaltake Golden Orbs. Just like I had back then. 
These are noisy little buggers, but they look great and they cool well. These have a rather interesting mounting solution. So if you turn them clockwise, the base plate will expand. You can then install them and turn them anti-clockwise and they will lock into position. It's a bit finicky though, so it's not quite as easy as it sounds. These tabs are very close to our freshly installed caps. I don't think I will get this on camera, but there is less than one millimeter in between them. And once installed, it sits very firmly. The only thing I still have left from my original rig are these RAM sticks and this very long ID cable. I remember I had to special order this because there is a very long way from the motherboard all the way up to the top of the original case I had. So these are my original 256 meg sticks. And then I upgraded to these 512 meg sticks. I don't remember if I had four of these or just these two. This board will take up to 2 gig max. I also found this very crusty IO shield in my stuff. I can't say for sure, but this is very likely the shield that came with my original board. It doesn't look too good, but we'll use it anyways. Just for nostalgia. So I'm gonna go with two of those 256 meg sticks. And of course both of these 512 meg sticks. And this should give us a gig and a half. And then we have the hard drives. These were kindly donated by viewer tab mode. So thank you if you're watching this. These were the days of file sharing. So I actually had five of these damn things in my original rig. And these are of course the famous desk star. I find it quite suitable to kill one last desk star, this nostalgia build. I guess we'll do a quick unboxing here. I'm only going to be using one of these. And the other drive, I guess I will preserve and send it off to a museum in the future. Well, I have done this five times and promised myself never to buy one of these again. Yeah, here it is. The famous Desk Star. Brand spanking new, never used, preserved for almost two decades. Just for your viewing pleasure. These are 41 gigs. The drives I had back then were 250s and the system drive was about 100. I was also supposed to install this. This is a hard drive cage for ID drives. At one point I had five of these installed in my VP6. So I thought I'd install one, just for nostalgia. Unfortunately I ran out of paint, so we are going to install this in a follow-up video. And here's where I think my memory fails me. I was 100% sure that I had a Sound Blaster Live 5.1 in this machine. But this board has a VR Polo Pro 133A. So that can't be right, can it? I guess we'll find out. Graphics cards back then changed very quickly. I'm not entirely sure, but the most likely card to be the last card in this machine was either a TI-4200 or a TI-4400. Unfortunately, I don't have a TI-4400 and this 4200 here is broken. So we're going to fix it in a future video and install in this machine. And for now, I have borrowed this nice card here. This is a TI-500. Very nice and fancy, and it will match the case as you will see in a second. When choosing color for this project, I took some inspiration from one of those Alienware Chief Tech Towers from back in the early 2000s. This thing looks crazy now. But this is what a year 2000 Dream Machine would look like. So first I applied some primer, and then I applied two cans of the sparkling green color. I obviously went for green since this is an 8-bit board. Not sure what the camera will make of the sparkling color, but here in real life it just looks insane. So let's start building this crazy year 2000 dream machine. This tower is huge. Two cans actually wasn't enough, but by the time I realized it was too late. So this is not a cheap case anymore. So bottom part first, and then the lid on top of the case. 
I'm not going to install the rivets quite yet, because without the side panels, this case is rather flimsy. So to get the rivets in a perfect position, I better have both side panels on. I better secure those side panels too, to make sure everything is aligned. Same thing on this side here. I am of course going to remove both side covers once we have put all the rivets back in. Okay, all rivets are in. Let's install the reset switch, the hard drive LED and the power LED. The power switch is installed from this side, like so. I forgot to respray the reset switch, but I think it looks pretty good this way too. The plastics have aged well on this case. I'm going to apply some Vaseline on the hinges anyways, just in case. And then we have these for the power and hard drive LED. I don't have the key for the lock, but at least it looks better this way. Of course the diskette drive is green too. And I remove this see-through thing here for the LED. So I'll glue it back on. I managed to remember to respray the eject button too. The hardest part when restoring a diskette drive is to get that lid back on with that tiny little spring. It took me a good 20 minutes to get it back on. But first the blank for the unused slot. I considered installing a zip drive. But I'm not too keen on respraying my zip drive in metallic green. The drives are installed in a drive cage before the drive cage goes into the case. Oddly enough, only one of the screws on each side for the diskette drive lined up. Uh, now we can install the drive cage and lock it. Pretty serviceable case. I uh, managed to remember to remove that see-through window for the LED. The CD-ROM drive is of course green too, because why not? We are going all in on this crazy project, aren't we? Well, that's an unusual sight, that's for sure. A sparkling green metallic CD-ROM drive. Uh, I guess we better install some covers before we install the CD-ROM drive. That's a snug fit. Then we have the usual guesswork, which screw holes to use on the rails. How about that? That looks nuts. I'm not sure what to think about this crazy build. Well, I guess the door is up next. Now that looks pretty nice. This tower is so big, I'm kind of struggling getting it all on camera. Let's install the side panels. Well, since the side panels were installed while I replaced the rivets, they still fit perfectly, of course. The side panel has a nice and green handle to match the rest of the case. I ran out of paint before I got to the inside of the handle, but this looks pretty good inside the machine. Well, I still don't have the key. I'll install the lock anyways. This case came with original feet, but I think this case looks much better without those feet. So I'm gonna skip them. Okay, let's see how this fully assembled case looks like before we install the motherboard. Well, crazy as it is, I actually think it looks really good. And it's a huge case. So if you compare it to this rather large CRT display here, that display looks tiny. And for comparison, here's the motherboard. This tower is absolutely huge. And I'd say it looks awesome. And especially with those green drives. I don't think I have seen green drives in my entire life. 
Okay, let's get back to the star of the show and install that VP6 board. Okay, well, I'm doing some tests here and when connecting a diskette drive, the LED just lights up. I have tried with several different drives, several different cables and diskettes and I'm getting the same behavior. On the display, I'm getting floppy disk fail, error 40. If we jump into BIOS, the diskette drive is recognized. And first boot device is set to floppy. So the floppy controller seems to be dead on this board. If I connect the hard drive and the CD-ROM to ID1, I'm getting these really weird characters up here. And it says primary master and then just some weird characters. It recognizes the hard drive, but then I get a disk boot failure. Insert system disk and press enter. If I connect the hard drive to ID2, I'm getting primary master none. And it doesn't recognize the drive at all. And we're getting a disk boot failure. If we jump into BIOS, we've got no drives at all here. So the second ID channel is completely dead. When I move the hard drive back to primary master, I just get a blank. It doesn't say none, but it doesn't show the hard drive either. If I move the hard drive to the RAID controller, the hard drive and the CD-ROM actually shows up here. And the system actually boots. So the RAID controller seems to be working. And the board seems to be running just fine. Apparently this drive has Windows installed. And as you can see, it seems to be working just fine. So the board runs, but we have no floppy or hard drive controller. I uh, guess I'll order parts now and we'll fix it in the overclocking video. If you're watching this in the future, there will be a link here to that video. If not, use the bell icon below and set it to all. And YouTube will notify you. I would like to end this video by saying thank you to my patrons. You guys are great. Thank you for your support. If you would like to become a supporter of this channel too, you will find the link in the description below. Thank you for watching, like, subscribe, leave a comment and I'll start recording the next video.